Welcome to the Conscious Diabetic Podcast. Hello, guys, and welcome to the Conscious Diabetic Podcast. Um, thank you for joining us, as always. Um, obviously, you can catch us on Spotify, YouTube, um, Amazon Music, and everywhere else. And today we have our guest spots, um, or we're back doing your our guest spots with people of um, sort of notable knowledge and excellence within the community. And today we have an individual called Paul Coker, who has a master's in science, is it? To do with diabetes? Yes. Yeah. And yeah, yeah we're going to be talking about uh, diabetes. Obviously, Paul is a type one diabetic as well and has been for quite some years. So please, yeah, just give us an introduction, Paul, what you do, who you are, and a little bit about your diabetes background, please. Okay, so uh, I'm 49 years old. I was diagnosed with type one diabetes when I was five, that was back in 1977. And like most people, you know, mum and dad looked after my diabetes. Um, wasn't really much of a problem for me, but then I hit those teenage years where I started to take over management of my diabetes, or probably more appropriately, mismanagement of my diabetes. Yeah. Um, and I had the typical teenage response to it. I want to be like all of my friends. I don't want this. Um, and it wasn't so much a pity party. I just kind of ignored it. Um, and I carried on that way from when I was about 15 or 16 until I was in my mid-20s. Uh, not quite sure how I got away with it, but ultimately I ended up being, I, I was on a fitness drive in my mid twenties and I was going to the gym and I'd been doing it for about six or eight weeks. I was just starting to feel really good. And then I got a chest infection and I thought it was just, you know, one of those things that happens in, in the winter every year. Maybe it was flu, maybe it's chest infection. And I just carried on as normal. And then one day I went to work with this chest infection and I had to walk up a flight of stairs to get into my office. And at the time I was working in IT. Um, and so I've walked up this flight of stairs. And by the time I got to the top of the flight of the stairs, I was drenched. All of my clothes were soaking like I'd been out in the rain, but it wasn't raining. And I had to sit down at my desk for about 30 minutes before I even had the energy to pick up the phone and call the doctor and say, hey, what's going on? And it turns out that I didn't have just a chest infection or, or just the flu. I had double pneumonia and pleurisy. And it also turned out that in all likelihood, it was because I wasn't managing my diabetes very well. And so we did a HbA1c test. And at the time we were still using percentages. So my HbA1c was 17.5%. That's a and big number. That's a big number. Yes. So today we'd be looking for an HbA1c of what below 7.5%, which is what 58 millimoles per mole. So we're probably talking in terms of around about 200 millimoles per mole. I've never actually done the calculation into new numbers. Um, so things needed to change. And so I started to engage in my diabetes and I started to get uh, better at it, but it came in waves. So I'd have periods where I, I'd kind of really engage and I'd really do a, a good job of managing my diabetes and then the complacency would creep back in and then before you know it I was batting off DKAs and I was batting off sickness and then I'd tighten up again and I'd get better at it and that went on for probably about five or six years and it all changed when something came into my life and that something was, uh, it, it weighed six pounds and it was my daughter. Uh, so she was born and I came home from work when she was about six weeks old. I came, I came in from work and I picked her up to give her a hug and she screamed the house down. And then the next thing I remember is waking up being covered in Coke, Coca-Cola. And I'd passed out whilst I was holding her in my arms about two seconds after I picked her up and I passed out with a hypo. And at that point I realized this is serious. I've got a, this isn't about me anymore. It isn't about me not taking care of my diabetes. It's about me not taking care of my family if I don't take care of my diabetes. Mm -hmm. and, and that was really the first big and serious wake up call. And I, so I was 30, 
yeah, 30 years old at the time. And I then went on to a really big hard drive of managing my diabetes. And I've been doing reasonably well ever since. So I don't get, the, you know, I don't try and aim for a HbA1c in the fives or the sixes. And in fact, if we look at the evidence on that, there's a sweet spot of HbA1c between 6.5 and 7.0%, which is, oh, I can't remember what the, what, what the numbers are, I'd have to look them up. But um, it, it's, if, if we go lower than that, we find that the increase in complications and mortality of diabetes actually appears to increase. And that's what the evidence tells us. So as a result of all of these things that were happening, I got really quite engaged in diabetes and I was reading more and more about it. And I went back to university. Uh, excuse me, let me just grab a... Went back to university and I wanted to know more about diabetes. So I was studying anatomy and physiology. And um, I, I learned a lot about how the body normally works. And of course that gave me unique insights or at least I thought unique insights into how diabetes worked. And then I started with one of my university friends going out and walking and we'd walk in the hills. So I was studying in South Wales close to the Brecon Beacon. So every Saturday morning, we'd be out climbing, or well, I say climbing, walking the hills in the Brecon Beacons. Um, and I started to learn about how my blood glucose changed as a result of the activity that I was doing. And not only the, the duration of the activity, but also the intensity of the activity. So we didn't, I, I was on an insulin pump by this time, but we didn't have CGM. Um, and so I was stopping every 30 minutes and doing a blood glucose test while I was out on the hills. And after doing this for a, a number of months I, and logging it every time, I started to see there was this pattern that was happening. And I could almost predict what was going to happen with my blood glucose level by looking at how steep the hill in front of me was going to be. Yeah. And so I developed this routine where you know, I was cutting back on basal insulin in my pump and, and fueling up with glucose according to the terrain. And that worked really well. And then we had this great idea. And the idea was we're going to do the three peaks challenge. Yeah. And I, I, train I, I, yeah, I know this. My father-in-law's done this actually. And uh, yeah. So, so the three peaks challenge is to climb the highest peak in Scotland, which is Ben Nevis, the highest peak in England, which is Scarfell Pike and the highest peak in Wales, which is uh, Snowdon, and to do all three of them in a 24 hour window. And of course, there's, there, there's at least 10 hours of driving between those three peaks and about 14 hours of walking. And that starts to present some unique challenges. Now in training for it, we did the Welsh Three Peaks Challenge, which is a similar kind of a deal. It's 16 hours to do the highest peak in North Wales, which is Snowdon, the highest peak in Mid Wales, which is Kader Idris, and the highest peak in South Wales, which is Penavan. And through that training program, I was, I was fit and I was able to walk up and down the hills. But when we did the second mountain, Kader Idris, it was always the second because it was in the middle. Every time we got there, I would be hypoing all over the place as I was going up the mountain. And, and everything that I'd learned up until that point I was trying it and using it and it wasn't really working. And I knew about a guy called Ian Gallen, who was running a, who's a specialist in diabetes, sport and exercise. And he runs a website called runsweet.org. So I went onto his website and I had a good look around the website. I couldn't see anything that applied to me and the challenge that I was doing. So being the cheeky kind of chap that I am, I looked for the email address on his website and I sent him an email saying, dear Dr. Gallon, I'd really appreciate some advice or some help, or can you direct me to somebody who can help me? And before I knew it, I was on the phone to his registrar, who at the, at the time, a guy called Dr. Alistair Lum. Now, um, Alistair is now a consultant in his own right and has been for quite a number of years and specializes in diabetes and exercise. And I spent a couple of hours on the phone to this guy, I'd never been his patient. He didn't know me from Adam and he was just good enough to reach out and help me. And just a small, a, a 
couple of small tweaks to my strategy and suddenly everything clicked into order and it was working. Right. And what, and, what, what, what were those tweaks? Um, so it was, a, it was about actually fueling uh, and it was to start loading up with carbohydrates mm -hmm. three days before I did these events. So at the time I was low carbing and he was like, no, you, you're, you're not going to have the energy in the muscles to be able to sustain that kind of endurance and to, to sustain the um, blood glucose levels, unless you're going to go really slowly. And because mm -hmm. you're in a speed challenge here where you can't go slowly, you're going to need carbohydrates. <laughs> so uh, that, that was the, the first big thing. And, and actually, I think all of the evidence at the time was saying a 50% reduction in basal rates. And he suggested, you know, I know that's what all of the evidence tells us because the evidence is built around safety. But why don't you try going a little bit lower than that? And so we reduced the basal even further. And now that's become quite a, a, a de facto thing. But at the time, it wasn't. Um, so... As a result of doing that, I, I kind of finished that challenge and I thought, I need to do something else now. And I decided I was going to do a park run, having never run in my life because diabetes was always in the way. And I trained for a park run. It took me eight weeks from never having run more than about 100 metres in my life to, to do a park run. And what I found was that the strategies that I used for learning to walk in the hills could be applied to jogging because of course they're both aerobic forms of exercise uh -huh. and it translated almost perfectly very little requirement now i decided that i was going to do this park run just to prove that i could do a park run and then i was never going to run again and i i was challenged by a friend to, to do it and he's a, a running coach and he trained me for it but after the park run was over for some reason that I'm still not clear on, I decided that I was going to push the boundaries a little bit more. I was going to go and do a half marathon and see whether I could actually just be the boss of my diabetes. Um, so I spent five months training for a half marathon and I did that back in 2013. I ran the Cardiff half marathon. It was my first ever half. Again, it was supposed to be a once only deal. Um, Two days after I ran it, I was raising money for JDRF. They contacted me and they said, oh, this is amazing. Thank you for raising all this money for us. Really, really impressed. And, and you know, we, we can't thank you enough. Oh, and by the way, we've got a challenge running. and We think that you'd be just the man for the team. I was like, oh, yeah, really? What are we doing? And they said, we're going to take the largest ever team of people with type 1 diabetes and we're going to climb Kilimanjaro together. <laughs> and how's that? Oh, wow, that, that sounds amazing. Now, I'd already been diagnosed with retinopathy and I'd already had some laser treatment some years before. And I'd previously spoken to them about the possibility of climbing at altitude. And they'd said, uh, no way, you shouldn't do it. If you've got retinopathy, being at extreme altitude can actually cause retinopathy to deteriorate. Uh -huh. And there's a, a theory that says that in low oxygen environments, we start pushing out um, an enzyme called VEGF. Now, this is the very enzyme that causes or, or it has a major causative effect in retinopathy. So we, as people with diabetes, we develop it because the blood vessels are occluded and the eye is starved of oxygen. But when you're at extreme altitude, there's less oxygen around. So you start pushing out a load of VEGF and that causes the growth of new vessels. And it happens even in people without diabetes who are healthy athletes and they're young. So they were saying, no, you really shouldn't do this. And I, I said to JDR, if I'm, I'm not sure if, if I'm able to, I need to speak to my ophthalmic surgeon. So I went away and spoke to the surgeon and he said, no, you really shouldn't do this. You'd be, you'd be silly to do it. And I, I listened to everything he had to say. And he was saying, well, we, we think that it could cause this. And, and there's a suggestion that your retinopathy may deteriorate from being at altitude. And, and as I'm listening to this guy, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, that there are all of these risks that you're putting in front of me. 
how many of the how many cases have there ever been of people with type 1 diabetes being at extreme altitude and their retinopathy deteriorating as a result so uh, I, I popped this question to him and he, he looked a little bit stunned and he said oh we've got no case evidence it's just a theory right <laughs> so i was like okay i i acknowledge your advice and i respect that and as a result of it i then went back to jdrf and i said okay i'm interested who's the chief medical officer for the trip and as it turned out it was dr ian gallon the guy who runs the run suites website so i live in wales and and Dr. Gallen, I think he's retired now, but was in practice in England and NHS Wales wouldn't refer me to NHS England. But I have a belief in life that if you don't ask the question, the answer is always no. So if you ask the question, the answer might be no, but at least you know that you've asked the question. Yeah. So I phoned up his secretary and I said, OK, th this is the deal. I'm interested in doing this. I can't get a referral via the NHS, but is Dr. Gallen in private practice anywhere and his secretary said oh yeah just give this hospital a call He's, he runs a private clinic there a couple of times a month so sure enough i picked up the phone to his private clinic made an appointment it cost me i think it cost me about 100 pounds to see this guy and i've had some really good diabetes clinics in my life i've had some really bad ones mm -hmm. but this is by far the best diabetes clinic appointment i ever had I went in to see this guy and for the first 45 minutes, he hardly said a word. He just wanted to know my story, how I've managed my diabetes over the years, what I was doing, how I was doing it. He then wrote to my diabetes team and to my ophthalmic surgeon. And he then came back with a risk assessment on it saying, yes, this could happen, but the risk of it happening, in my opinion, is quite small i can't guarantee it's not going to be an issue but we're building an extra day of acclimatization into our trek and that will help we're spending very little time at extreme altitude and that will help and your diabetes is well managed and that will help and it's been quite some years since there's been any progression of your retinopathy it's been stable for the last seven years and that will also help so all those things considered whilst i can't tell you it's safe for you to do it's probably not unsafe <laughs> yeah I don't, at which I don't. point i kind of signed up on the line and said that's it i'm going so in 2014 we had a team of 19 of us with type 1 diabetes that set out to climb kilimanjaro together um and um I th there were 18 of us that actually made the summit uh, sorry, sorry, 17 of us that actually made the summit. Um, and as far as I know, to this day, we're still the largest team of type one athletes to actually summit Kilimanjaro together. And there was something that happened on that mountain. And that something was peer support. Until that time, I'd never really experienced peer support in the, in the type one diabetes world. And I met up with 19 or 18 strangers all of whom had an experience of living with type 1 diabetes that was a little bit different to mine, but in so many ways, just the same. And if you've ever been to a diabetes event, it's kind of like what, where you see somebody else with type 1 diabetes, oh, one of us, and suddenly a stranger becomes your best friend in moments. So you can imagine what that's like in an extreme environment where you're like that for six days continuously. And it was just absolutely incredible. Now, I, I had type 1 diabetes for 38 years at that time. And I came back and I start, at the time, the, the whole idea of a diversary was starting to become a, a thing. You know, when mm -hmm. I was diagnosed, nobody celebrated when the, the <laughs> day of diagnosis. It was something you'd rather forget. Um, and I began thinking about this idea of uh, celebrating 40 years of living with type 1 diabetes. And I thought, well, I've climbed Kilimanjaro. I don't want to go and climb Kilimanjaro again. I can't afford to go and climb Everest, and I'm not sure that I'd want to anyway. So what can I do? And I had this momentary 
madness where I decided that I was going to run one half marathon for every year that I'd lived with diabetes in my 40th year of having diabetes. So I traveled around the country and even to certain parts, to other parts of the world. And I ran 40 half marathons in a single year in between 2016 and 2017. And that really pushed the boundaries of endurance and it would for anybody, whether they've got diabetes or not, but it also pushed my boundaries of endurance on consistently managing my diabetes because what it really meant is that for every four, in every four weeks, I was running three half marathons. There was very little rest time. I didn't have time for injury. I didn't have time for hypo, severe or otherwise. I didn't have time for high blood glucose levels or DKA. And I really needed to support myself with the best nutrition, the best training program so that I could get through this. And about that time, or, or just before I started that, I switched my diet massively. So I, I was already fit and active and exercising all of the time. And I was trying to do it on a carbohydrate restricted diet. Now, up until that point, apart from Kilimanjaro, what I was finding is if I go out and run a, a half marathon, I could do it on a low carb diet, but actually during the half marathon itself, I had to have carbs. I, I needed to be fueling up and I also found that after a half marathon, I was exhausted. I was just tired for weeks, maybe even months before I could go out and run that again. So in setting this challenge to run 40 half marathons in a year, I knew that I had to get my recovery times to, to be fast. And in going into the evidence and research on this, I discovered that the thing that a muscle needs after exercise yes, okay, we need to give it some amino acids and some proteins to rebuild, but actually it needs glucose. And exercising, muscle, and exercising muscle is going to burn glucose and it needs glucose back. Now yep. you can give glucose back on a low carb diet because your body's going to use ketosis to, to make some sugars, but you're not very efficient at doing that. So I decided that I was going to start eating a lot of carbs, but I didn't want my blood glucose levels to go crazy. Mm -hmm. And given my background, I started reading the research on this. And I discovered that when we're on a carbohydrate restricted diet, we're on a diet that is high in fat. And we have to be, because we can only get energy from carbohydrates, fats, or proteins. Mm -hmm. So when we eat a diet that is high in fat, we're actually inducing insulin resistance or a reduction in insulin sensitivity. And it turns out that that reduction in insulin sensitivity starts about 150 minutes after we eat a high fat meal. Now, going back to our early days, Brett, when we were eating a meal, we were carbohydrate restricted and we were only ever testing for up to two hours after a, yeah. a meal. Then, so no one ever saw that. You know, if we eat a high fat meal, we get a delayed gastric emptying. So our blood glucose level in the first couple of hours, it looks great. And then the two, around about two and a half hours after a meal, we see that our blood glucose level goes up and it doesn't just go up for a little while. It goes up for quite a long time. So it's about eight to 10 hours that we see this insulin, uh, this reduction in insulin sensitivity from a high fat meal. Turns out that if we add proteins to fats, it gets even worse and lasts even longer. And then there's also another problem that comes with this is if we're eating high fat meals all of the time, we're increasing the amount of fatty acids that are in our blood and we don't get rid of these. These are precious, they're energy and our body doesn't like to get rid of energy. So we store them and we store them in the liver and we store them in the muscles. Now, if you start storing fatty acids in the liver and the muscles, if you didn't have diabetes and you did this and you're in middle age, before you know it, you're going to have type two diabetes. It's one of the it's one of the key things or one of the key causes of type two diabetes. Not every case, but many cases we see that fatty acids in the liver and muscles are increased. That causes insulin resistance. And and sorry, is it this misconception about carbohydrates? And and this is something I talked. I think it was my last podcast was the carbohydrates are not the enemy, but it's the type yes. of carbohydrate. Um, and also just this misconception that seems to. I see it in the, say, the USA community, 
that everyone's harking on about oh and don't have more than 50 grams of carbs a day or don't have this or don't have that but i also find it depends on what your energy requirements are for the day what you're doing what your activity is and all these variables which i don't see a lot of people take into account yeah so i think there's there's something that's really really important you know we, when we talk about fats we talk about healthy fats and unhealthy fats, you know, the saturated fats, the polyunsaturated fats and saturated fats. And we try to describe some of them as healthy. When we talk about carbohydrates, we don't do that. We mm -hmm. just talk about carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Now you and I both know that eating a banana and an apple is incredibly healthy, but eating a slice of pizza or a Snickers bar is not, but yes. they're, both car they're, they're all carbohydrates. Yes. And, and yet somehow along the line, the, the nutrition world has never classified carbohydrates with a consensus statement saying, this is what healthy carbohydrates are. And actually, you know, the, let, let's be clear, the brain is an obligate user of glucose. It must have glucose. Mm -hmm. And for people who are following carbohydrate restricted diets and severely carbohydrate restricted diets, the evidence shows us that they actually have cognitive decline. Yes, I've seen this evidence as well, that you, there was a term called, called it, especially when you get older, a reduction in glucose it's called sticky memory or sticky mind i think they called it um yeah yeah where, where there is a reduction in cognitive function i i can't lay my hand on the study right now yeah. but one of the studies actually looked at this in the short term as well and they they put individuals without diabetes onto low carbohydrate diets for a number of days and weeks and they tested their cognitive ability before the diet then they tested their cognitive ability on the diet and they found that their cognitive abilities were severely reduced on low carbohydrate diets and then they recovered when carbohydrates came back mm -hmm. so I, th I think that this is actually really quite important you know we, we want the we want to live the best life that we possibly can mm -hmm. so coming back to this idea of carbohydrates if we're fueling up with carbohydrates well it makes sense that we fuel up with high quality carbohydrates that are unrefined Mm -hmm. It makes sense that we reduce the amount of fat and we reduce the amount of protein and then we reduce the insulin resistance. We increase the insulin sensitivity. And in doing so, we don't get huge big blood glucose spikes as a result of eating the carbohydrates. And even when our blood glucose level does go up, which is normal and natural, and even in people without diabetes, it comes down again very quickly, very easily with very small doses of carbohydrate, very small doses of insulin. Mm -hmm. But the really important point here is that in doing all of that, of course, you're fueling all of those muscles up you're f and that gives you the energy to perform. You're fueling the brain. And so the brain becomes much more effective and, and your cognitive ability goes up. But also by eating a diet that is high in unrefined carbohydrates and low in fat, what you're also doing is a huge big step on protecting yourself from the effects of cardiovascular disease. Now, for those of us that are living with diabetes, this is the complication that we should all be worried about. People with diabetes, are, you know, we, we, we've already spoken about retinopathy and we can mm -hmm. talk about nerve damage. But the thing that actually kills people with diabetes is cardiovascular disease. And those of us with type one are a four to eight fold increased risk of that in our life. Now, the again, the, 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 there's lots of controversy around this, but the evidence appears to be quite clear that diets that are higher in fat promote cardiovascular disease and they promote um, high cholesterol levels and they promote high blood pressure. Now, the three things that we need to be looking at in terms of our diabetes health are one, our HbA1c, yeah. two, our cholesterol levels, yeah. and three, our three. blood pressure. Yeah. Now, if we can get two of those three things in good shape, the third one is not quite so important. And it doesn't matter which two, HbA1c may be marginally more important than the other two combined. But if we can get two of those in good shape, then we're probably in a reasonable place for preventing the complications. On the other hand, if we're eating a low carbohydrate diet and we're pushing our blood pressure up and our cholesterol up, mm -hmm. the, the impact of, um, of improving HbA1c is somewhat offset by those other risk factors that you've increased. So it's about getting this balance right. And I'm not saying that fats are good or fats are bad or that carbohydrates are good or carbohydrates are bad. What I am saying is that fats and carbohydrates will compete with each other 
to get access to the cell to give it energy. Yeah. And it's a, yeah. it's a race that fats are going to win. And when fats win that race, they actually stop the insulin from binding to the insulin receptor sites on the cell surface. And what that means for us is that our blood glucose levels are going to go up in the hours after a high fat meal because the insulin cannot do its job. Mm-hmm. So, in, in ter- so, so then in terms of my diet for running the 40 half marathons in a year, I massively increased my carbohydrates. And I went from eating an average of 70 grams of carbohydrates per day to eating 800 grams of carbohydrates per day. And I needed less insulin for that than I needed for 70 grams, even though, yeah. okay, my activity levels went up a little bit, but I was already running on a daily basis before I did the half marathons. I didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, this is a good idea. I was out walking in the hills. I was running longer distances of kind of eight to 10 miles multiple times a week. So I, I wasn't. I wasn't arriving at this from couch potato and saying, oh, look, activity is the thing that's doing this. Yes, of course, training 40 half marathons and doing them increased my activity levels a little bit, but not enough to actually say my insulin sensitivity, which went up by 17 fold from eating more carbohydrates, could be explained away just by activity. Yeah, this is something I found was, um, again, when I did my, it was called my 100 day challenge a year and a bit ago again my was a 20 even without my food just my body fat at roughly around 22 percent and then when it got it i got it down to actually 9.9 percent also my basal insulin just due to activity as well and just the body fat percentage going down my basal insulin went down by approximately i think about 50 percent as well just on a normal day and you could see that correlative data and that interaction between activity, your body, the, the way your body composition was as well, and the the benefits of the activity. The, because when you're doing exercise, when you're doing all these things to improve yourself, you can't let that final bit being your food be crap. In, in for one of the better words, there's no point doing it. If you're only going to put rubbish in, your your aim is to train or to be like in optimal performance, shall we say? You can't fuel yourself with bad fuel. It's the same analogy with a car or anything else. Yeah, I, I've spoken about this in terms of being a car. So if you had a Formula One racing car, would you put two star petrol in it? <laughs> and the answer is no, of course not. It's not going to perform. Yeah. So your body's the same. You've got to give it the fuel that it prefers and that it wants in order for it to perform well. Now, there are, if we look at the evidence on exercise, there are some benefits to low carbing for exercise and what we see for endurance athletes is that they will often do a low carb period for a few weeks before a a long endurance session but it's not in the endurance session so it's part of their training plan Mm -hmm. in the lead up usually ends two or three weeks before the the event and of course this is about fuel sparing and then they give them carbohydrates again and it gives them some advantage does that work in diabetes the answer is I honestly don't know. Um, there may be some advantages, but I'm, I'm not the expert on that particular area of, of nutrition and diabetes. Um, so um, in, in going back to this idea of the 40 half marathons in a year, I ended up touring all over the country and I went off and, and ran some in, in Spain and I, I even went over to the US to run some half marathons. And I ended up getting two other people with type one diabetes also running with me. Um, So there was one guy running in the States, a guy called Cyrus Cambata, who runs Mastering Diabetes. Uh, Okay, uh, so yeah, I see the, um, I see the social media stuff that they do. It's great, uh, great evidence-based social media and diabetes. um, And and of course, because I was doing this plant-based, high carbohydrate, low fat, there was a, a kind of synergy between us. Um, and when he heard my story, he wanted to be part of it. So he ran the 40 half marathons in the States. I was here in Europe. And there was also a, a lady called Amy McKinnon in Australia, who's a runner with type 1 diabetes, who went and did this as well. Um, now, Amy's now married. Her name's Amy Carrion, and she's now living in the States. But So we had, these, we had this kind of international team that actually did this 
Um, and, and it was quite incredible. But at the end of it, my last half marathon, we decided, or, or I decided that I was going to work with Diabetes UK and we were going to bring the largest team of people with type 1 diabetes together to run a half marathon. And so the, the last event in 2017, I had 26 runners with type okay. 1 diabetes join me. And it was, you know, a really special moment. And a film was made for um, a company called Pocket Medic who talk about diabetes and exercise. Um, and it was really quite special. And then I thought I was hanging up my running shoes. But it didn't quite happen that way. So the, the team that had run with me said, this was amazing. And we love the peer support and it's our favorite race ever. And, and we want to come back and do it again. Please organize another one. So the next year we did it again and we had 69 runners with type 1 diabetes join us. And at that time, I got involved with something called XTOT, which stands for Exercise and Type 1 Diabetes. It's run by the yes. Association of British Clinical Diabetologists. And I have been I in touch with them. Sorry, I have been in touch with those guys. I'm, I'm waiting to hear back. <laughs> I'll, I'll put in a word for you. I'm speaking okay. at one of their conferences tonight, actually. Oh, okay. Um, so um, I, I got in touch with them and I said, hey, look, I, I know you guys do a lot of research on type 1 diabetes and exercise. I've got 69 athletes that, well, I'm aiming for, a, I was aiming for 100. So I, I'm aiming to get 100 athletes with type 1 diabetes together to come and run a half marathon. Do you guys want to do a, research projects i actually read this life. paper sorry i read this paper i think two weeks ago i, I read the results but yeah i did this is this was so we um, ended up with the x todd 101 study which i'm yes. a co-author of yes uh, and this was the first time that a a group of athletes with type 1 diabetes have been followed in a real world setting because all of the other studies are done in a laboratory environment and of course we don't live there mm -hmm. and, and so it, it's really quite humbling to think that my little idea of doing a little bit of running has changed the shape of diabetes and exercise education for many um and you know it's one of the things i'm most proud of mm -hmm. um so i then ended up speaking at the ex todd conferences now ex todd are about training healthcare professionals typically dsns and di and dietitians in the mechanics of diabetes and exercise and every year they run this series of conferences and then as a result of my relationship with them i started getting invited to go and speak with them and i've been doing that for seven years now um, and as i said tonight i'm speaking at one of their conferences and in part of doing that I was then invited to, even though I don't have a background in, in nursing or as a doctor or a medical background, I was invited to go and do a master's degree in diabetes practice, which I've just finished. And I've, I'll find my results out on the 30th of November. I'm hoping to graduate. Uh, I'm sure you'll graduate. December. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure you'll graduate. <laughs> um, and now as a result of all of these things, not only am I running the website onebloodydrop.com, which is all about diabetes and exercise, I'm also running a website called transformyourdiabetes.com, which is all about how to move to a whole food plant-based diet that's high in carbohydrates and low in fats. Now, I'm not trying to turn the world vegan. What I'm trying to do is to give you more choices in how you manage your diabetes. So my program's set up so that you know, I put you on a whole food plant-based diet for a period of about four or five weeks. And then we start introducing the other foods. And I then give you the freedom to, you know, I've given you these tools and these strategies for managing your diabetes. We bring in the other stuff and then you decide, okay, I, 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 want, to, I want to bring in all the, you know, the, the milk and the dairy and the cheese and, and, and the meat and the steak and the barbecues and all the rest of those things. And, and I'm happy with that. Or I want to do it now and again, or I don't want to do it. And all of those things are fine because I believe in we need to give people more strategies to manage their diabetes well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really where I'm coming from right now. Um, and uh, it, it's turning into quite an exciting journey. I've, uh, it, this is a new venture for me. I've had about 30 people go through my program now and the results are phenomenal. I'm seeing both in type one, I, I serve mostly type one diabetes, but both type one and type two diabetes, I'm seeing massive improvements in quality of life and in insulin sensitivity. Yeah. So the 
I think with the strategy side of things, if someone acknowledges what they are, who they are, being diabetic, and then I believe if they acknowledge by, by setting a goal, and then naturally you're going to want strategies that actually complement that goal or that aim, that facilitate that aim and goal as well. And as you say, giving people strategies that they would never have thought of, and especially, like I say, when when they read, say, public information things like social media um there can be that there's a lot of information out there and then what they're trying to do is naturally distill that information without the knowledge or application or even a scientific method um of, of to distinguish what's good information what's bad information and i think with your strategies and obviously with your your legacy shall we say <laughs> your what, what you've done you you've proven you've tested it you I, and again, obviously, having a master's degree and the yeah, the, and, that, that, uh, and my dissertation, my research project, was actually looking at the impact of the macronutrients on insulin sensitivity in adults with type one diabetes. Okay, so, you know, we we always talk about the need for insulin for carbohydrates, but we never talk about the need for insulin for fats and proteins. And actually, yeah. it's quite well recognised in the literature that we need it. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, our dosing strategies are that we have them, we have those needs discreetly hidden within our insulin to carbohydrate ratio. But my own theory from, from reading all of this is that our insulin to carbohydrate ratio is flawed and it's flawed on the basis of it's developed with the idea that we eat similar meals at the similar at similar times every day. Mm -hmm. you know, breakfast is perhaps cereal and milk or maybe it's yogurt or maybe it's some toast and lunch is maybe a sandwich and then the evening meals you know maybe it's pizza maybe it's burger or, or maybe you're having a salad or whatever it is but it's developed around your dietary patterns and that's why we see that or, or my theory is it's one of the big reasons why we see that people with type 1 diabetes are saying well I gave my dose of insulin for the right number of carbohydrates and it just seemed like, like my insulin had turned to water yeah because we're not accommodating for those other changes now there have been some uh, studies that have looked at this and how we actually dose for fats and, and proteins and the, one of the biggest or most famous ones is something called the Pinkowska equation and it's a really complicated formula that works out how much how many calories you're getting from fat and how many from protein and then how to dose for your insulin for it and it works but the problem is that people that use it tend to be reporting that they're getting lots and lots of hypos after the meals okay. and there are a number of variations on this that have been done around the world and i think there's only one that i'm aware of at the moment that's actually showing some promise and that's in a paediatric clinic in New South Wales. Um, and they're much less aggressive with the way that they're dosing for it. And it remains to be seen how good that will be. But I think what we come to is the insulin to carbohydrate ratio is, it, it needs some work. We, yeah. we need yeah. to understand, are we dosing for fats and proteins with it? Are we dosing for carbohydrates with it? And if we are dosing, or if we are dosing for carbohydrates for it, we get to a pure form and we know what that looks like. And then we can start to calculate what our requirements are for fats and proteins. Yeah. And I think yeah. that there is a need to do that, but very much a reluctance to do so because it's complicated. Yeah, It requires a lot of input clinically to help us to do that or a very motivated individual to find out how. Um, and, you know, it, even before COVID, I don't think we had the resources within the healthcare system to do this. And now with the pandemic, of course, much less so. So I think that there's, there's a lot of work still to be done. And I think also closed loops will help with this to some degree, but they're not going to be perfect because again, they're based upon an instant to carbohydrate ratio. Mm -hmm. There isn't a closed loop system out there yet that's saying, I ate this many grams of protein and this many grams of fat. Uh, and I think that until we actually get to that position and we've got robust algorithms that tell us our, our systems how to actually address that, 
Anything and, and Pixis is because sorry. he's going to continue to be a moving feast. Yeah, and the algorithm obviously has to be based on uh, a data, a, a set of data anyway. That they will have yeah. to establish that, and that data needs collecting. Um, but again, this is something I, I. It's hard for people. Uh, we'll, we'll say the average person doesn't measure their macronutrients as well. This is the the, no. the, the other thing, and I, I think you'll find with the athletes they have to, and I do. I, I literally measure every single thing. Um, uh, yeah, I literally measure every single thing that oh, that goes in my body. My battery is going to run out. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I think that that's entirely true. But in this day and age, with the apps that we've got available on yeah. smartphones, whilst they may not be perfect, I think they give us a fairly good idea of what we're consuming without requiring us to do too much work. Yeah, it's much easier now, isn't it? That's And again, that's it brings us on to one thing that I was going to talk about was technology and the way that technology really has transformed things from, I remember from 30, 40, yeah, 35 years ago and yeah. the leaps and bounds that have happened over the decades. And what's your, let's say, what's your dream for say 50 years time for, for diabetes and technology? Uh, I think... I think it would be a fully closed loop dual hybrid insulin pump that has um, a robust continuous glucose monitor in it that is real time. So at the moment, continuous glucose monitors are real time, but they're measuring interstitial fluid. So we've mm -hmm. got this 15 minute lag. Yeah, It would be a wonderful if we could actually see what the glucose in the plasma was actually like in that moment. Um, and then to be able to make an adjustment based upon it. And by being dual chambered so that you have insulin and glucagon, yep. then you can do something about it. Um, and I think that it would also contain some algorithms. It would still need some uh, ability to, uh, to add data yourself, but to be able to tell it that I'm going to do some exercise because, you know, I'm using closed loop insulin pump now and it is it's brilliant it's wonderful but it's less good at knowing anything about exercise yeah the type um, of exercise or the effort show again because in terms of effort, in terms of exercise it could be a steady state exercise or it could be maximum effort for 10 minutes 15 minutes or it could be reduced and that really does take an effect on the the energy requirements for the muscles and also even the groups of muscles i found because it depends on what i do how long i do it for can can really like sap out uh my blood sugar and then i get to a certain level and then i can continue for quite some time it, it's and that's the type of exercise that i do which is a uh, is different yeah so i think that w one of the important things here is that if we if we look at how different exercises work on your blood glucose level what we find is that anaerobic exercises things where you're working at maximal effort you can only do them for kind of 20, 30 seconds, maybe a minute at most. They're, they're going to cause your blood glucose level to go up. Mm -hmm. They're going to make you insulin resistant. Re resistant. And that's, that's actually quite a good thing. You know, think about it in terms of when we were living on the African plain and we were trying to run away from that lion, we'd be sprinting at full speed. But even if we didn't have diabetes, do we want our blood glucose level to tank so that we run out of energy? No, of course not. We want to outrun that lion so that we're not lunch. Mm -hmm. um, so our physiology is designed so that when we do those maximum effort things, uh, we become resistant to insulin as a result of adrenaline and cortisol and catecholamines, and our blood glucose level goes up. Now, when we do aerobic or steady state exercise, our blood glucose level typically goes down mm -hmm. so knowing those two things you can actually then start to build an exercise program yeah. that can help you to actually exercise without needing so much glucose and this is this is the idea of spending money on what we call the glucose credit card and, and the idea here is that if you start your exercise program off with a sprint it's going to put your blood glucose levels up or if you start it off with weights it's going to put your blood glucose levels up and then if you finish with steady state cardio work on the treadmill or on the rowing machine or or on the bike that's going to put your blood glucose levels down mm -hmm. so instead of you know normal gym session is going to be you start with a warm-up on the 
on the running machine or whatever, and then you move on to the weights. So you put your blood glucose levels down, you have a hypo, you treat the hypo, then you put your blood glucose levels up with the um, anaerobic work and your, your blood glucose level is a bit of a disaster. But if you actually reverse the order mm -hmm. and you do a, a warm up so that you're not going to just pick up the, the weights or, and injure yourself, but you do the weights first, put the blood glucose level up, do the steady state afterwards, bring the blood glucose levels back down again. We actually find we compensate quite well. Yeah. And we don't need as yeah. much glucose. Now, if you're trying to do exercise as a weight management thing, that's suddenly very powerful. You're no longer needing to eat all of these carbohydrates you know, and all of these calories that you're trying to burn. Yes. The problem with it, and the reason I call it the, the glucose credit card is in doing that, you've still burned that energy and it's a debt that you've built up a bit like spending money on your credit card and that debt is going to become due and it becomes due about eight to 10 hours after you've done the exercise and your blood glucose level will go low then yes. as a result of you recovering the glycogen back into the muscles. So you've got to be ready to either lower your basal rate on your pump or to fuel up so that you don't have that and, and late post-exercise hypo. Yeah, I find this training in the morning. I, I get the, I, it's lucky that I run my own businesses and so I get to train in the morning. I do that with the weights, with everything. And then you'll find the afternoon flat as a pancake, refueling, doing everything. And it's one of the most, it's one of the best things to see as well. And then I also train in the evening as well. So, um, and then mm. my nighttime is also flat as a pancake. Generally I do look, no one's perfect. And I do get peaks and troughs, but it, that all depends on certain things with effort and the type of exercise as well. And I think that the timing of the day in which you exercise is also important. Mm -hmm. by, by choice, the best time of day for people with type 1 diabetes to exercise appears to be first thing in the morning. Yeah. And that's because we're naturally insulin resistant in the morning. And yeah. by exercising, you can exercise your way through that insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. It protects you from the hypo and it makes your whole day much flatter than it would otherwise be yeah. without needing to give loads of insulin and then have a hypo when the insulin's still in the system but the insulin resistance has worn off yeah it, it's yeah i i saw it with my data and having that data um with the cgms and with the tandem and with everything really opens up those doors of um utilizing or utilizing that data uh, and interpreting it or having a professional interpret it getting that advice or getting the advice of people like yourself um to understand what the implications are as well yeah, I think so. And I think one of the one of the things I would say to people that are listening to this is find out how to use your CGM if you've got one. If you're lucky enough to have one, find out how to use it because we're all really good at looking at, at the number and we might even be looking at the curve, but do we really know how to interpret that curve? Yeah. And there is so much data that's included within it that we're not even aware of, you know. Mm -hmm. it, a trained eye can look at your your daily chart and they can tell whether you're pre-bolusing for your meals or not yeah in an instant and there are so many things that you can actually do and the abcd website has some great resources on it on using one, the libra one moment i just need to plug in my yep. laptop before we... There we go. We're back on. Uh, no, we're not. No, not. <laughs> Preparation. There we go. We're back on now. So yeah, we can carry on now. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> That's all right. Um, where were we? Um, so, so I, I, I was saying there's some. If you go away and learn how to interpret the data coming from your CGM, the, the you know, know how to read the AGP curve is really quite important. Know how to read the daily curves as well. Mm -hmm. And there is some fabulous work done by the Association of British Clinical Diabetologists, ABCD, uh, what are they, abcd.org, I think. Um, and they, they've got some really, really good learning resources that are free available there for you to be able to do if you're going to look at all of them it's probably going to take you probably 10 hours or more but 
it's definitely an investment worth making because the more information that you've got, the more able you are to make to, to decide the strategies that work for you and your diabetes. Yeah, and this is something I try and uh, I, I have a thing called the four pillars of diabetes, which I talk about in my book when I've got it finished. And one, one of those is knowledge, is not to be blind to the knowledge that's out there and also be blind for it yourself. And then intelligence is one of them, is the application of that knowledge as well and the understanding. So those two things really served me well with just always having the hunger to, to improve or to learn more about diabetes, not just to, to sit there and say, hey, diabetes owns me. Um, this is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a prisoner of it. Um, it, it. It frees you from that jail by by getting that knowledge and yeah, interpreting and applying it. So there's a, a, a quite a famous quote by a guy called Dr. Elliot P. Joslin. Now, Dr. Joslin was the first, he, he's the father of modern diabetes medicine. Um, and, and he was actually practicing as a diabetologist before we had insulin. And he made this quote in 1908, and he said that the, the, the patient, the, the person with diabetes that knows the most about diabetes lives the longest. Mm -hmm. And that's something I've always carried with me. You know, I've got technology, I've got insulin, I can do all these different measurements, but if I don't know how to, how to interpret it and what to do and what actions to take, the value of those things is much less. Yeah, I, th there's one thing I always try and do as well is technology is great, but also what happens when technology fails. And I, I also have those foundational, that the foundational knowledge of what happens if this goes wrong or what happens if, or why this is happening or what, like, instead of saying, I have a CGM, I have a pump, I'm all okay. And that's it. Yeah, I think that that's really important, Brett. And I, I really do like this. Uh, one of the ideas that some of my uh, colleagues on the MSC promoted to me, and it's something I've now done, is I've got my sick day rules and I've stuck them to the fridge door with magnets. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I've done that is touch wood in 30 years, I've never been so unwell that I can't manage my own diabetes. But one day it might happen. Mm -hmm. And what are my wife or my children going to do? They don't know enough about my diabetes in the moment to moment to be able to manage it on my behalf. But now that that information's on my fridge door, they've got a reference source. Yeah. And, and I think that's that, you know, that, that's just simple stuff to do. OK, it's on the fridge door. It looks ugly. And and maybe you don't want a poster in your house saying, hey, look, everybody, I've got diabetes. But you know just find somewhere that is accessible in an yeah. emergency for that. Well, another thing again another thing it, it related this is i think we talked about it before we started doing the filming was i used to treat my diabetes as an enemy and or, or a fight and one thing i think we'll, we'll finish soon as well was when you fight against something there's generally only ever there's a winner and a loser and i i changed that relationship to a friend I, I i made diabetes a friend and someone that walks with me into the future um as a partnership and it, it, that that's what defines me as a diabetic now instead of a, 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 and it is the victim mentality that i grew up with actually from such a young age and that didn't serve me well only until recently um when i stayed with a a, a very well-renowned diabetologist and yeah it changed it impacted and changed my life and it switched the way things were for the, for the positive yeah i think that that's that's really really important and i'm not having a go at diabetes uk i think they do some wonderful work but i just find it so sad that they you know the largest organization that represents people with diabetes in the uk have a logo of no diabetes fight diabetes yeah and i know that that I, I know that their aim is to actually fight diabetes on the level of making it go away mm -hmm. but actually if you start fighting diabetes it's, it's exactly what you say it's a battle the whole way through try and find a way to make some peace with your diabetes perhaps we i don't think any of us are ever going to accept it um i'm not sure i ever have it's probably accepted as much as it ever will be but I've made some peace at least for now and for the last 15 years, and hopefully that will continue for the foreseeable. 
where we work together and it's in this partnership and some days are good days for me and some days are better days for my diabetes and and we kind of have this almost like a dialogue of okay so what do you want me to do about that <laughs> it's almost like look it, you you might have a wife you might have children you're going to fight with them through, through it like all day one day or regularly and it's only the same with diabetes there's as long as you make up and, and go forward then that's fine absolutely okay um, yeah, we'll 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 close off. We've been we've just gone on our hour, I think, and an hour's a long listen. But um, yeah, is there any sort of final words that you want to say? Um, I, I did put in my notes three three sort of tips, and then any final things or resources that mm-hmm. that you can that people can visit to learn more about you. Yeah, so uh, I th- I think that the number one thing I would say is stay active. If we look at the evidence the people that are living well for the longest with diabetes are active on a regular basis whether you love or hate exercise doesn't really matter it doesn't have to be going to the gym or going out for a run you know get a dog take it for a walk um, go out for a walk with your wife every day you you know whatever it is find a way to to get some activity in on a daily basis your insulin sensitivity will improve and that will improve your chances of longevity and that will improve your quality of life Um, find the diet that works for you you know i've been speaking about how i do my my diabetes with a plant-based diet that's high in carbohydrates and and low in fat and low in protein it's not for everybody but then again neither is low carb Mm -hmm. so find the method that works for you and finally don't get stuck in beliefs about diabetes because beliefs are intrinsic they're really hard to change you know if you say to somebody if somebody says i believe in god you're never going to change their mind that there isn't a god if you say i believe in low carbohydrate diets are the only way to manage diabetes you're never going to change the mind your mind but if you have ideas they're much more flexible so i've got an idea that a whole food plant-based diet is the very best diet for everybody on the planet, regardless of whether they've got diabetes or not, but even more important for people with diabetes. But it's only an idea. And if you can present to me data and suggestions that I can improve upon that, I'm open and re- ready to accept that. But if I believe that this is the only way, or I believe that low carbing is the only way, it's, I get so entrenched, I can't change. Yeah, you construct your reality with your beliefs. Is uh, there's one of the, and that's a deeper conversation. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, and, and I think it's you know ideas are more powerful than beliefs in my view. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, it's, know, it's, have, it's, sorry, it's open. Ideas are open to open to be tested, and then literally yeah. tested, and then retested, and tested. And if it works, it works. There's no argument. And, and there will be different ideas that work at different phases of your life. Mm-hmm. You know, what works for me now that I'm almost 50 wouldn't have worked for me when I was 15. Yeah. So um, are there any, and so where can people find you as well? Um, so the, if you want information about the diet side of things and the nutrition, then it's transformyourdiabetes.com. And if you want information about sports and diabetes, I've got a website full of free resources that's recommended by uh, the Association of British Clinical Diabetologists over at onebloodydrop.com, where it's the number one rather than the word one. Okay. And so are you on social media? Uh, Yes, I am. So you can find me on Facebook. Um, You can also find me on Twitter. So uh, on Twitter, I'm at one Paul Coker, and I'm just looking up my Instagram because I don't use it very often. <laughs> this, is, this, is very where, this is where we connect with the youth. <laughs> yeah, uh, so so I'm on Twitter as one bloody drop. Okay. Uh, so not Twitter uh, on Instagram, Instagram as one bloody drop. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and I've not delved into TikTok. I think I've probably I'm probably a little bit too old and past it for that you never know (laughs) okay so you've been listening to the conscious diabetic podcast and vlog on youtube or spotify or amazon music whichever one it is uh thank you for listening guys and thank you to our very 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 knowledgeable guest paul coker 
And hopefully you can take something away from that to improve your diabetes or your family, friends uh, with diabetes as well. And hopefully I'm going to have some of the guests that we were talking about um, on future podcasts. So guys, thank you very much. Uh, big love to everyone and the Conscious Diabetic. You, uh, we're done. Thank you. For more information about being a Conscious Diabetic, check out ConsciousDiabetic.com. Check out our Conscious Diabetic socials on Instagram and Facebook at Conscious Diabetic. Are you a conscious diabetic? Leave us your reviews and feedback. Thank, 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 thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Big love. 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 Love.